Pregnancy Care Center um, has two locations, actually, one in North York at Bathurst and Shepherd. Sorry, thank you. Bathurst and Shepherd in a second office uh, in Scarborough. And we've had 25 years of uh, serving individuals that are facing unexpected pregnancies. Uh, the organization started as a response uh, to some of the first standing, uh, freestanding abortion clinics here in Toronto as a compassionate response to women that um, felt that they were forced, uh, they were feeling alone and unsupported in their pregnancies. And a group of individuals that were uh, motivated out of the Christian faith came together to wanted to provide that support, that wraparound assistance that we've been talking about and hearing about uh, today. Um, so over 25 years, there's been about 4,000 women that have uh, given us the privilege of sharing with them in their life journey and dealing with uh, the issues facing an unexpected pregnancy. Uh, in the few minutes that I have, I'd like to just tell you, uh, in fact, Teresa has done a great job of explaining uh, the work of pregnancy centers in terms of offering services, but perhaps I can put a face on it by sharing with you a client's story, a lady uh, that we'll call Susie. Susie has given me permission to share her story, and uh, she's a client that currently is, uh, is with us. Uh, she actually was a woman that saw our sign in the Shepherd Plaza, which was unusual because the majority of our clients today come from internet search or 50% uh, of them come from referrals from other agencies. But Susie came in with her boyfriend and they wanted to uh, talk. Uh, they wanted to talk about some of their options. They wanted to hear a little bit more about abortion procedures. They wanted to have a, a pregnancy. She wanted to have a pregnancy test done. So, in the pregnancy test, uh, it did uh, it did show test positive, and uh, calculated that it was about nine weeks since her last menstrual period. And then, as we talked, uh, it was uh, mainly me listening, listening to her, listening to uh, what some of the issues were related to her unexpected pregnancy. And very quickly, I realized that uh, Susie actually knew what she wanted uh, in terms of her, uh, of the outcome of her pregnancy, because Susie um, told me, uh, asked her about her previous uh, pregnancies and whether this was the first one. And Susie said, no, about a year ago, um, I had an abortion. And uh, so I got some information about the dates and the time, and I just said, Susie, how did that go? How did that go? Well, tears welled up in her eyes, and she said, not very well, not very well. And she proceeded to tell me that the next few weeks, uh, she, after the abortion, she said initially she felt the relief because when they were uh, facing the unexpected pregnancy, there was no way she wanted to tell her parents. There was no way she wanted to give up her scholarship uh, from, uh, from university. There was no way that she wanted to continue. But as, uh, as she made that decision and her and her boyfriend made that decision together, it was a decision, although it brought relief because their problem was out of the way, it became a source of torment for her day and night. She wasn't able to sleep. She would wake up crying in the middle of the night. She phoned her boyfriend on the cell phone. He was up in the middle of the night. She uh, lost interest in her studies. Her good relationship with her parents started to get uh, be, be distant. Um, all of a sudden, she wasn't doing well health-wise. She started facing, feeling depressed and, and had a lot of difficulties as well in her relationship with her boyfriend. And her boyfriend just didn't know what to do. He felt badly. And they were struggling. But things got better. At least, they, at least the pain, the raw emotional pain got better until they came in to see me again, or see me at this particular point because they were facing a second unexpected pregnancy. It was further complicated because Susie is a daughter of newcomer parents to Canada and they had so many hopes and dreams for her. She's a bright young woman with scholarship. They were hoping that she was going to do well and, and just be able to not only provide for her immediate family here but send funding back home to the home country. And Susie had always been the exemplary girl. She had always done everything right. She had always been the child that her parents looked up to, and she did not want to disappoint them. She was a woman that identified herself with the Christian faith, and she didn't want to shame her parents by uh, recognizing that she'd been involved in sexual activity. For her, she felt was wrong. And so she was struggling with all those issues. Uh, we had the fetal models uh, that, we, that we heard about uh, today, and uh, we just talked about where uh, a child at nine weeks uh, of pregnancy gestation would be. And she looked at it, and she just burst out in tears again. And she looked at her boyfriend, and she says, I can't do it. And he says, we can't do it. We're gonna, we don't know how we're going to do it, but we can't. 
So uh, a lot of the time that we spent talking was just to, to talk about some of those issues, the financial issues, talking about how she is going to approach her parents. What were some of the issues? The very things that you've heard about, that her life did not have to end. She could complete her studies. They were uh, seriously had been considering getting married. They were thinking about forming a, a support system. He was willing to go alongside of her and walk with her through the, through the birth and, and the parenting of this child. So we met for weeks and weeks, uh, talking about one issue after another planning, strategizing. It took weeks before they had courage to talk to their parents. And in fact, when the parents were talked to, she got kicked out of the house. So there was issues of how to find safe housing. But over the time, uh, a few more weeks later, uh, both of the parents, uh, both sets of parents came to, uh, to acknowledge the pregnancy, to embrace their children. And, uh, and this couple uh, will soon be giving birth uh, to their first child. And uh, she is currently continuing her studies with uh, the plans of, of being able to graduate uh, later on this year. And, uh, and there's a lot of issues. There's financial issues. We need to talk about budgeting. There will be uh, issues of having to find a job for, uh, for Susie's boyfriend and working on a resume. And one of the issues, uh, one of the opportunities that we have is to connect people through the network of volunteers that are part of the Pregnancy Care Center. So we can connect them to uh, an area where, in fact, uh, the other night that they had an opportunity to meet with somebody who's giving them just some practical advice about parenting and is offering to provide some babysitting services. Others have provided baby clothes for them. And there's a whole host of things. And you uh, could just imagine uh, what some of those are. Now, we did initially uh, talk about a adoption, but for them, um, they chose parenting as, as certainly an option. Um, over the t uh, we also talked about that post-abortion issue, and we do run a post-abortion support program as well. Susie is not ready for that right now, and that's all right. Uh, we're just privileged and, and really very excited for her courageous, their courageous decision, and just to see the really beautiful changes that have, uh, have that this crisis, in one sense, has actually brought about some beautiful things in their lives, and we can uh, just celebrate with them. Um, one of some of the common denominators of the individuals that come to see us, alone, alone, alone. Uh, for our 25th uh, celebration, we called back some of the past clients that have received uh, support from us. And they all had a little bit of an interview with a video camera. And even though they'd never met each other, they come from various ethnic backgrounds, all different ages, they all said, I felt so alone, I felt so alone, I felt so alone, I felt so or overwhelmed. And you would have thought that they, we gave them the script when we asked them to tell us how they felt when they first came into the center, but they all repeated that. And they all felt isolated from true support networks. They really doubted that their family, their friends, their church, their community ties would offer them any meaningful help. And they didn't really feel that the people wanted to listen to them and really um, find out what their heart's desire was. And oftentimes those very first reactions from the people close to them had just such a significant impact on them. So if their mother responded and said, you've got to get an abortion, you're too young. Or if their boyfriend said, I am, you can do what you want, it's your choice, but don't count on me for support. Those are the very things that, um, that had a very deep and emotional impact. Um, the other, uh, some of the other things that we've also heard about tonight is, or today, is the anxiety and the fear and the shock and the surprise. And so they're definitely in a mode of not sleeping, they're in a mode of not eating, they're in a mode of not worrying and not necessarily thinking as clearly as they otherwise would. And a strong sense that they had to make pressure, make a pressured decision about abortion very quickly. One of the things we found very helpful is trying to help people sort out what they, uh, what their circum what they would do if their circumstances were different or just helping them realize that they've got some time and they don't need to make a rush decision. And to make a decision that they really believe will be consistent with their own values. Because oftentimes the remorse is even greater if they have had a strong sense that they shouldn't abort and then they go ahead and do it anyhow, oftentimes because of pressure of other people, then they think back, you know, why did I do this? That's completely against who I am. It's interesting that the age level is not common. 
Although Susie uh, was around 22 years old, we do see younger clients, but we also have individuals come to us that are in their, in their mid-40s, uh, dealing with uh, issues of unexpected pregnancies. So that is one area that, that's not consistent. But the issues that many of them present are that they don't have a supportive partner, and their, their financial circumstances, and their fear of loss, loss of uh, their career, loss of their schooling, or as has been uh, also mentioned, loss of their life plans. If um, I was to make some of the comments, although I have not been at the center for the 25 year uh, history, but from uh, understanding from past, uh, past directors that have been there, I understand at the beginning, 25 years ago, when the abortion debate was more in the public eye, we had a lot more individuals coming because they were feeling that they were moral, there were moral and implications, moral and ethical implications of abortion that were so strong that they felt that they really couldn't abort because um, society would feel, make, make them um, feel badly, uh, that they believed that abortion would be wrong, but they just didn't know how to do it. So we had a lot more individuals 25 years ago that would come and say, you know, I just believe it's wrong, but I don't know how to do it. Can you help me? Whereas now um, we're finding that we have less people that would be morally and ethically um, basing their decisions. Perhaps, as, as Andrea said, uh, in a generation today of relativism, they may believe one way or the other about abortion, but that may not necessarily have an impact on their particular decision. Uh, some of the other issues is, are that we're seeing more women come alongside that have had previous abortions before, or, or have friends that have had previous abortions, and they're saying, you know what, I watched this friend and that friend and that friend had an abortion, and I don't want to go there. And we're having uh, quite a number of individuals that are facing their second or third uh, pregnancy and also reflecting back on their past abortive situations and realizing that they don't want to go there. But uh, the bottom line is, and the, the final point that I would like to make is that the medical community doesn't seem to have time to listen, is that is what they're telling us, that um, they, they oftentimes assume that a woman facing an unexpected pregnancy will want to terminate her pregnancy, and uh, they don't have the time to ask and to listen to find out really what their heart's desires are. So they're complex situations. We need to have a lot of people to come alongside of, uh, of, of those that are needing help. And we certainly feel from our perspective uh, a greater need for partnership and raising awareness in each one doing what we can so that those first reactions to people and uh, those opportunities uh, for support are expanded here in the city of Toronto. Sisters of Life were founded by John Cardinal O'Connor in New York in June of 1991. Uh, currently, we are a community of 70 sisters, and there are five of us here in Toronto. Uh, we're located at, uh, <laughs> um, actually in, in August of 2007, with the invitation of Archbishop Collins, we moved here to Toronto and are currently located at St. Augustine Seminary in Scarborough. There's a convent at the seminary, and that's where we live. Uh, we're hoping this fall to open up a mission center a little bit closer to the, the center of the city of Toronto where we'll be able to uh, meet with women and also open up a toll-free line for them so that uh, uh, we're more accessible to the women who we serve. So how do we serve pregnant women? Um, in order to serve a vulnerable pregnant women, woman, it's, it's really important to understand her heart to understand where she's at. And we've heard a lot today you know, about the, the fears that she's feeling. She feels that there's no one to support her. And um, you know, we've heard that's why a woman will choose abortion is because she feels so alone. Um, those that she trusts the most have abandoned her, her family, the father of the child, and her friends. And so this is really the time when she needs support the most. So how do we provide that support for her? We provide support through our network of coworkers. Our coworkers are a network of the faithful laity based in uh, local parish communities. About two times a month, we go out and we speak at the end of mass and we explain to the parishioners the work we do and we invite them to join us in serving uh, the pregnant women. 
and the, uh, our coworkers will see the Sisters of Life as a bridge that connects them to do good for those who are in need. They are able to share their gifts with pregnant women in need, whatever those gifts may be. And uh, most importantly, they're, uh, they're able to offer hope for a pregnant woman. So what are the different roles of a coworker? We have a, a holy respite. A holy respite is a family or a couple, or maybe even a single woman, who is able to welcome a pregnant woman to live with her. A handmaid is a woman who is able to spend time with a pregnant woman, to talk to her on the phone, take her to a doctor's appointment, maybe just go shopping with her, uh, take her out to lunch, just to really spend time with her. A visitation brother is a man who is able to act uh, as a mentor to the father of the baby, if the father of the baby is um, still part of the picture. Uh, we have what we call St. Joseph's workers, which is a, a, a handyman. Uh, it's someone who can help maybe put a crib together or someone who has a truck or a van who would be able to help a woman with a move if she's got to move from one place to another. Uh, business professionals, uh, it's someone who's able to hire or to assist with hiring a woman either before or after she gives birth. College contacts are very important. Um, a person who works in the administration of a college or university who is able to help a woman with a transfer. Lawyers and doctors uh, who are willing to provide professional services to a woman either for free or at reduced rates. And one of our most important um, uh, co-workers are our prayer guardians. And these are people who are able to commit to praying for a woman, um, especially during her pregnancy. And so what we'll do is um, when, when a woman comes to us, we will email, we will email a, um, a prayer request to the prayer guardians and uh, we, will, we will always assign a, like a pseudo name to the woman in order to protect her privacy. Uh, we also have what we call visitation coordinators, who is someone in a parish or local, um, you know, in the local community who knows the people and knows the resources within the parish and is able to make those connections and make them you know, happen quickly. And then we also have all good things providers, which are, are individuals or groups who can provide like gift cards for uh, maternity clothes or baby items or food. And um, we also brought uh, the brochure, the, our brochures which explain the coworker program in a little bit more detail. Once a year we conduct uh, a general coworker training session and we invite those who have signed up to be coworkers to spend a day with us and we'll go over, uh, we share with them things that will help them work more easily with the pregnant women that we serve. And these sessions will include uh, a segment on basic interpersonal communication skills, which will help the coworkers confidently talk to a pregnant woman one on one. And then several times a year, we conduct smaller, uh, more specialized coworker trainings, which, um, which will build on the general coworker training session that we have once a year. We'll remain in regular contact with the woman and with her coworkers throughout her pregnancy. And obviously, questions come up, and uh, so we're available to assist the coworkers um, as necessary. Uh, so just to kind of summarize, it's really, it's really important to walk with a pregnant woman and, and to feel her pain. Um, sharing resources or just giving her material things is not enough. It's important, but it's not enough. She needs the heart and the love of another. When she knows that someone delights in her, then she can delight in her child. She'll believe in herself because someone believes in her. So I just want to end um, by telling uh, you the story of a pregnant woman um, that we have the privilege of serving with one of our coworkers. And I'll call her Kateri, which is not her real name. When Kateri became pregnant, her parents and the father of her baby pressured her to have an abortion. She went to the clinic, but she knew in her heart that it was not the right thing to do. She left the clinic without having the abortion. She contacted us by email through our website. At first, the correspondence was only by email. Our sister asked if she could call her. Kateri finally said yes and then gave sister her phone number. And they spoke. One of the things that she said to sister was, it's hard when everyone is against you. 
I cried a lot. She really felt alone. And so Sister introduced her to a handmaid who was the young woman that we met at one of our parish visits. The handmaid really connected with Kateri. She drew Kateri into her circle of friends who became a great, um, a great source of support for her. And she's now in a healthy living situation, living with others in a home with other small families, and is looking forward to giving birth to a little boy within the next few months. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Margaret Russ, and um, I have been asked by Carrie Vandergrift, who is the executive director of uh, Beginnings Counseling and Adoption Services, to speak on her behalf because she is um, out in Hamilton now placing a baby for adoption. She was here this morning, so I was kind of asked on short notice to prepare a little presentation. Um, so I am an adoption practitioner as well as um, an infertility counselor, and then I also work with beginnings, um, and I do some of the birth parent counseling for them um, in the GTA. Uh, so Beginnings Counseling and Adoption Services is a nonprofit agency located in Hamilton, Ontario, and it provides free and confidential pregnancy and adoption counseling services to um, women and their partners um, where there is an unplanned pregnancy. Um, we have been around for 24 years, we're entering our 25th year, and we have satellite offices in Coburg, um, Guelph, and in one more place, and in Woodstock. And we service pretty much all women across Ontario. We have birth parent uh, counselors that are available to drive anywhere in Ontario. Um, we get most of our referrals from doctors, community resources, um, birth parents themselves, and their families. Um, for many birth moms, abortion isn't an option by the time they come to us. Either they found out too late, um, and it's too late for them to have an abortion, or abortion is simply not an option for them. Um, if they are still toying with abortion, thinking about adoption, uh, abortion, then we certainly are equipped to counsel them as well. Um, so as a birth parent counselor, my role is to meet with the birth mom, possibly the birth dad, and anyone else um, who she identifies as a person of support. And I talk to the birth moms um, about their choices, the pros and cons of parenting for them versus relinquishing their um, unborn babies, or at that point, born babies for, um, for adoption. Um, I really educate them on what adoption means nowadays. It's so different from what it used to be. Now, um, adoption is pretty synonymous with openness. So not only does um, the birth parent choose the adopted family, but they're able to stay involved in the child's life on the periphery for as long as they want to. Um, so when I explain that to the birth parents, they, a lot of them seem to be interested, a lot of them seem to be intrigued and very happy about the fact that if they do re decide to relinquish, it's not forever. They, they can still have access, they, can still, uh, they could still have some sort of a connection with the child and the child's new family. Um, so, Sometimes I'll see the birth mother just a couple of times. I'll go over all the options. We'll work on some exercises in terms of, um, you know, finances, whether or not she has the supports. And then at that point, she'll decide that she wants to parent, and that's fine. And um, we'll still stay involved with her for as long as she needs to be. It needs to be connected with us. Um, other times, they decide that they do want to go ahead with an adoption plan. And when that happens, uh, we start preparing a social and medical history. So we gather as much information as we can on um, who she is and who her extended family is and what their medical um, background is, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the birth moms don't know who the birth father is or they identify a couple birth dads or they know who the birth dad is but they don't want to tell us. So we really have to 
finesse our way around that because it's really important that we try to collect as complete of a social and medical history on the birth data as we can. Um, after we collect the history, we're able then to start presenting the birth parents, birth mom or birth parents, with, with, um, with prospective adoptive couples. So what we do is we ask the birth parents what they would ideally like to see in, um, in an adoptive family, whether or not it's, you know, certain um, cultural background or socioeconomical background or whatever it is. And then we pick based on the profiles and home studies that we have back at beginnings. Um, then, as a birth parent counselor, I will go over the profiles and the home studies um, with the birth parents. They'll choose a family, they'll meet the family. If all goes well, then um, they'll start, uh, the two families will start talking about um, a birth plan. If the baby is not born yet, then usually the adoptive families will go to the hospital and will um, see the baby at the hospital. We certainly do encourage the birth mom and the birth parents to spend a lot of time at the hospital with, with the baby, holding it, um, naming it, um, you know, really saying goodbye to it as well. Um, if the baby is already born and we don't have a family chosen, the baby sometimes will go into like a special foster home, where they call, we call them safe homes, and uh, once the family is identified and the placement is approved by the ministry, then the baby goes um, to, to the adoptive family. Um, I think really what uh, Carrie wanted me to stress the most is that um, adoption is a viable option for these, uh, these women who experience unplanned pregnancies. And adoption nowadays has come such a long, long way. It's, it's open and the birth parents don't have to say goodbye forever. Thank you.